Hey listeners of Brave Crime, this is Mary Ann with Crime Scene and Cupcakes. I'm a retired investigator who opened a boozy bakery, but I just could not give up the hunt because a friend of mine was murdered in 1989 and her crime still goes unsolved today. I hope you will join our podcast, Crime Scene and Cupcakes, as we investigate her case and many others in the state of Kansas. Crime Scene and Cupcakes can be found on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and most other streaming platforms. You can also find us on YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter. I hope you enjoy this episode of Brew Crime. Mike and JT are two amazing guys. Welcome to Brew Crime, the podcast where we drink brews and talk crime, conspiracies, or whatever catches our attention. This is Mike and my co-host, J.T. Jay Tizzle. Jay Tizzle. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We are starting a new theme, but also we're going to try something a little different coming up now. So we're going to try to do... One theme over two episodes instead of uh, one theme per episode. So this episode is going to be me telling a story about a crime in Alberta. And the next episode will be JT telling a crime in Alberta. Which means you're going to get one episode per week, more or less, plus one of our fun brewery reports or two per month. Meaning you should have an episode basically every week now. Yeah, and that's kind of our way to 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 become, you know, to to release a little more often, but also bring down the length of the episode so that they're in kind of, you know, dinner portion chunks instead of like all your calories in one day. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's kind of like what we were going for. Let us know what you think about it. Yeah, and I mean, if you don't like it, too bad. I don't know. <laughs> We'll see. I, th- I think if enough people are like, hey, go back to the other one, um, maybe we'll think about it. And, oh, yeah, and probably, probably will. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll, we'll consider. <laughs> but this way we can keep things kind of bite-sized and uh, reasonable and also more frequent. So Exactly. And, I mean, people like to be able to have a new episode every week. And uh, mm-hmm. we couldn't do that the way we were doing it. We just couldn't. So we thought we'd try this and see how it goes. Yeah, contrary to popular belief, uh, we both have day jobs. Um, this yes. is not it. I would love for it to be, so join our Patreon. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Where you'll get another bloody episode per month. Yep. And all these episodes as early as we can get them to you without ads. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So, um, yeah. Well, Mike, it's your go, and you just mentioned that it's crimes in Alberta. Yes. So we're, we're going back to... Uh, provinces or territories in canada mm-hmm. we're, we're getting fairly close to the end really we've got a couple provinces or territories left but not a ton but this time it's alberta my next door neighbor mm. or as some people say texas of the north <laughs> Jesus. that's because of just how much oil comes up out of alberta oh okay not grand mm-hmm. abbott that's fine and I have a beer pairing for this one. I've never heard of this brewery or this beer, but they're from Alberta, from Calgary. So we're going to try it out. And it's not quite in season anymore because this is a cuffing season winter ale. So it's uh, it's a a little out of season considering it's August now. But who gives a shit? It was... (laughs) It was the only Alberta beer I could find that wasn't a sour beer, and I've had stomach problems today. I didn't want a sour beer today. Hmm. And I don't know what makes this a winter beer, because uh, winter ale, most winter ales are pretty strong. This is a 5% alcohol beer, 20 IBU. Pretty light in color. It's not full of a bunch of spices, really, which is usually get from a winter ale. 
but it is called, or it's Cuffing Seasoned Winter Ale, and on the back, it says, having a brew with my pal, and it has a line that you can write a name on it. So I'm going to write <laughs> JT on there. Oh, Is that for, like, people who collect cans? or Maybe, I don't know. You put your name on it so people don't, I don't know. It's got kind of a slightly sweet smell. I'm not really catching a lot of aroma. I don't think you're going to like this. Oh, there's the sweetness. Um, definitely got some sweet spices. And then it finishes a little bit. Yeah, it, it's definitely old. Not the greatest. Um, it's definitely some vanilla or something in there. Does it say what the ingredients are? Everybody here listening has heard you describe beers in the past. And if you're not quite sure, that concerns me. It tells me they were trying to do a couple different things, and they didn't really do them well. Uh, it just tastes old. That's the problem. It doesn't taste fresh. Whatever. It was an Alberta beer. Woohoo! I, I paired it. <laughs> yeah, I, look, I did it. <laughs> yeah. I did the All thing. right. The title of my story is Last Man to Hang in Alberta. Jesus. <laughs> so, Robert Raymond Cook was born on July 15th, 1937, to Father Raymond Cook and a mother that I am unable to find the name of in Alberta. Which, fucking hell, like, why are all these really sexist things out there where you can never find the mother's name? Mm. That's a good question. Right? It is, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. He was a kind and friendly child and was known to be very good with his hands. He would be good mechanically, and would even learn to drive a truck before his 10th birthday. Jesus. <laughs> Unfortunately, life would turn upside down for Robert when he was nine, as his mother would pass away. He That's would start to get crazy. himself into trouble as he started to rebel, which, you know, which happens sometimes when you're young and a parent passes away. Yep. His father would remarry when he turned 12 to his school teacher, Daisy May Gasper. You're right. You're you're absolutely right. Alberta is the Texas of the North. Daisy May. <laughs> da, da, okay. All right. Uh, this this is like the creation or makings of a Jerry Springer episode. Yep. This is troublesome. He did not seem to like her. And this is when his rebellion turned from annoying to illegal. Hmm. They would pick up their life in Hannah and move to the town of Stetler. Stetler was a pretty small town with a population of 5,695 in 2021. So pretty small. Yeah, it's pretty small. Basically a perfect place to get in trouble. <laughs> well, course. he would lie through his teeth and had a habit of borrowing cars without permission and stealing things, he was known in town as a friendly but troubled person. That's what they call me, friendly but troubled. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I think we've all kind of known people that, yeah. not like this, but they, they get themselves in trouble, but they're, they're, they're still well-liked regardless of the fact that they do stupid shit. It's literally every dick in high school yes yeah <laughs> honestly um for sure yeah yep he would be in and out of jail for petty crime much of his life but never would be arrested for violent crime <laughs> well he didn't get along with his stepmom the family would grow over the years as the parents would have five children together Jeez. those children would be gerald patrick william Christopher Fred, Katie, and Linda May. They liked Christopher two word Fred. names. Yep, they sure did. Early in 1959, Robert would be in jail serving time for a burglary and car theft arrest. Hmm. Someone else in jail either had a beef with Robert or just wanted to show they were tough as they would strike Robert in the head with a pipe. Oh, oh, oh that took a dark turn real fast 
I was expecting a sandal or a, <laughs> a well. Fucking do you pipe. remember he was the last man to hang in Alberta? So it's going to take a dark turn. That's fair. He would suffer a major head injury and would never be quite the same again after the attack. Today, we would probably understand that he would suffer from something like CTE. Right. But that's today. Right. He would be angry very quickly. And this just wasn't him, but does remind me of many football players or other sports athletes. He would continue to steal and the like, but... He would fly off the handle easily, but still, there was no talk of physical assaults. He just would, you know, he'd just start yelling and screaming and get angry fast. Yeah, that's a result of, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Brain injury. Right. A filmmaker that got involved in the 2000s, Rick Smallwood, was quoted as saying, if a severe concussion scrambled his brain, he might have gone homicidal. But, again, he'd never be arrested for a violent crime. Hmm. Now, on June 25th, 1959, something horrible happened at the Cook Farmhouse in Stetler, Alberta. Someone entered the home and murdered the entire family other than Robert. Yes, that is the father, Raymond Cook, 53, Daisy Cook, 37, Gerald, 9, Patrick William, 8, Christopher Fred, 7, Katie, 5, and Linda May, 3. Jesus Christ. Yes. On June 26th, Robert would trade his father's car in Edmonton, a whole 200 kilometers or 124 miles away, for a convertible Impala. The police would pick Robert up on June 27th, the next day, as they realized something was up with the sale of the father's car. <laughs> they wouldn't know a thing about the murders yet either. When they arrested him, he had his father's paperwork, birth certificates, insurance policies, his father's latest marriage certificate, and even some of the kids' report cards. He also had some pajamas for children in a suitcase in a trunk, bed sheets, and a photo album with photos of his stepmother. <laughs> okay. On June 28, 1959, the police would end up at the family's home to talk to Robert's father to see what was going on with the family car. Makes sense, right? He's got this car that he sold. He shouldn't have sold. This is when they would find the bodies in a grease trench in the garage. They would first notice blood inside the home and the search was on. It's like, fuck, you walk in and looking for the father and all of a sudden you find blood all over the walls. First off, that's horrifying. Second off, yeah. I'm, I'm in, I don't really know what a grease trap is. Probably, I'm thinking that they have us out of a garage that was kind of like a shop where there was somewhere that if you did an oil change, the oil could be drained into it. Got it. That's my okay, guess. that makes sense. This didn't look good for Robert at all, and they would start to grill him hard. He did not do well under cross-examination, <laughs> and he would change the story time and again. At one time, he would claim that his dad paid him $4,100 for the car and that they were moving to British Columbia. Again, that's the province next door to the west. Right. And that happens a lot with Albertans. They come here. Lots of work here. Not a lot in Alberta these days. I don't know about <laughs> at this time. Sure. Now, of course, one of Raymond's friends would claim that he had no knowledge of of this and even had Raymond coming over soon to help move some furniture at their home. So it doesn't sound super plausible. Now they would fingerprint the house. And even though the home was full of people, they would only find prints for two people and neither were Robert. Hmm. The police would also work out that the murder happened around midnight, even though Robert had an alibi of being 200 kilometers away in Edmonton. Now, that alibi was a break and enter at a dry cleaner. <laughs> Jesus Christ. A real winner. Yeah. So, now all of these inconsistencies didn't matter, and they would lay charges on Robert, but they would only hit him with his father's murder. 
Now they would hold Robert on a mental health review at the Pinoca Mental Institution. This is the name of the institution at the time and not a term I usually use. Mm -hmm. On July 11th, 1959, would see Robert break free from the institution only days after he was denied the ability to go to his family's funeral. Wait, hold on. (laughs) Yes, he fucked off. He was like, you won't let me go to the family funeral that I created. Um, So, bye. Yeah. They would end up finding him at a local pig farm and rearrest him. Yeah. Oh, God. He would go through two trials and wait 16 months. But on November 14th, 1960 at midnight, his sentence of death would be undertaken at the Fort Saskatchewan Provincial Gaul or prison. Because back then they still called them Gauls. Ah, G-A-O-L. sketchy. Yeah. Well, you know, I think Canada in general called them that at that time. Oh, I just meant Sassy Sketchy. Always good for yeah, yeah. this. You know, Fort Sassy Sketchy. Execution. Well, this is still Alberta, but Fort Sassy Sketchy. Now, this case is not cut and dry. Mm. There had been some talk of missing money. And this quote comes from SmokyLake.com. The outcome left many questions unanswered. The actual time of the murder, the fact that the money was never found, and that one of the murder weapons, a shotgun, did not belong to anyone in the household. Historian Alan Hustak noted at the time that the case was so highly publicized that it would have been difficult to have a fair trial. Seven years later, Parliament amended the criminal code to allow a maximum penalty of life imprisonment except for a case of murder of police officers or prison guards. In 1976, the death penalty was abolished in Canada. So here are a few quotes. After each trial, Cook called his lawyers to the cell and thanked them profusely, said Judge McNaughton. Never ever did he admit to doing this, to me or to anyone else. He gave his body to the university hospital, his eyes to the eye bank. To this day in Stettler, there is talk about if Robert killed his family or if they killed the wrong man. Yes, Robert was a petty criminal, and yes, he had a head injury, but it was way out of character as he was still a well-liked guy, even with his criminal issues. So did they legitimately think it was him or they were like, this guy's perfect for this, of course it was him, and they didn't do much of an investigation? It almost seems like at that time they did, but as time has gone on, there's been more talk that maybe it wasn't. Mm. Um, so they even did a town hall in 2019. Um, Cook, while in his death cell, waiting to be hanged, wrote a poem. After Cook was executed, the poem was given to Judge McNaughton. Judge McNaughton read Cook's lengthy poem to a packed room at a Stetler Rec Center. I assume in 2019, because that's when they did the town hall. Mm -hmm. And here's the poem, read by Paige from Reverie True Crime. I sit here in my death cell, I know not why, for the evidence proved me innocent, and that is no lie. Seven members of my family murdered to date. The jury on a guess would make it number eight. Was it planned that way, or was it just fate? My lawyer's family threatened with the same. What reason can there be for such a dirty game? The judge directed, pay no heed and reject that lead. Pay no heed to another one. Pay no heed to the shirt and gun. Close your eyes, you need not see. Two places at once, I could not be. So I ask you, is it strange that I am sentenced to the noose while my family's killer is on the loose? He wiped up his fingerprints, all traces of his crime, putting a stained suit under the mattress, no doubt he knew it was mine. His purpose clear to see the murder of the missing member without fear of the fine. Time he would gain and safe he would be. So I ask you, is it strange that I am sentenced to the noose while my family's killer is on the loose? My family's funeral I wanted to attend, I had to escape and sealed my own fate in the end. 
If my loved ones saw and wondered why I was not there, I pray God told them of the hounds and the hare. They hounded me by day, they hounded me by night. Bloodhounds and helicopters, oh, what a sight. Out to murder, armed and dangerous, they said. That is so funny, I'll laugh till I'm dead. So, I ask you, is it strange that I'm sentenced to the noose while my family's killer is on the loose? I've heard of justice, but where can it be? I looked in the dictionary. Behold, there it is to see. When I sent for my lawyer, he just shook his head. Justice will only come long after you're dead. So you people of the world take note. It's murder when the innocent die at the end of a rope. So what do you think, JT? I I think he had too many syllables in one line. No, I'm just I'm just <laughs> It's I'm actually a pretty decent poem, but it's a, it's what do you decent. think of the case? It's decent. I it's it's fascinating if he was indeed in another place, right? Like it just seems like he was an easy scapegoat. A little bit, yeah. Um, but like I didn't hear much about like I mean the shotgun wasn't his, you said, or wasn't anybody's in the family. Yeah. So the question is where he get that. Right. And I couldn't get a lot of information about the shotgun in general. Sure. In the research, there wasn't a ton of information, unfortunately. I mean, yeah, there's there's a lot that that. I guess one of my questions about the shotgun is if it wasn't anybody's in the family, if they were able to exclude them, um, what excluded them, and why weren't those prints, if there were prints, run? Because if there are no prints, it's very easy to do that by just scrubbing down the weapon. Yeah. Um, but that's a that's a fascinating case. And the whole house, right? Right. Right. Good grief. So personally, I think that he likely did it. But my God, there is too much unknown to put him to death. It's I a mean, goddamn minefield. Yeah. I mean, I'm personally against the death penalty. Mm-hmm. But when there is so much uncertainty, I don't see how you can put someone to death. I don't understand what the use is, um, other than they don't have to do more paperwork for another yeah. trial or something. Um, it makes no sense to me. Uh, yeah. Just do the job, you know? Yeah. Like, life in prison seems like much a better option here, because... Maybe if he was still alive longer, they could have gotten more information from him and they would have kept investigating and found someone else. Or they could have proved it was him, right? Right. But they could have got to some truth more than we think it's him, so we're going to kill him. Ah, yes, InfoWars. The InfoWars strategy. Gay frogs. (laughs) Yes, right. Gay frogs are involved. Yeah. So let's Uh. finish this with some words about the filmmaker that I mentioned earlier. Although the filmmaker had supported capital punishment, this case changed his mind. Mistakes can be made in the justice system, but death is final, said Smallwood. I would hope that we, as a society, would be above that. Which, I completely agree. Like I'm against Mm -hmm. death penalty, personally, because if one person is put to death, that was innocent, that's mm-hmm. too many. As a oh, yeah. society, we are supposed to be better than the criminals. You sure as fuck think so. Um, yeah, and, I mean, he, like you know, like, this guy very well could be guilty. Yeah. Like, the head injury makes sense. Like, he could have done it. But we don't know that, and we can't prove it well enough. Mm-hmm. So, how can you put him to death? It, this is a case of guilty until proven guilty, right? Yeah, and I mean, um, it, it, it's no doubt that they changed the laws soon after in Canada because this guy may not have been guilty and you couldn't prove without a reasonable doubt that he was, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. Good. <sighs> yeah, so frustrating. Yeah. So frustrating. Ay, ay, ay. All right, 
Well, that is my case for Alberta crimes. And you'll get JT's next week. Yee, yee, it's a yee, yee. doozy. Do you want to give a hint of what you're going to be covering? Yes. Um, I mean, I could give a, I could give a, a really good hint. There's a TV show mm-hmm. that recently had a revival. Yes, the subtitle of my script is called Dexter Fire or Dumpster Fire. There we go. Hint, hint, hint. Yep, all of it. Good luck. Uh, yes, I'm sorry out of the gate because fuck this guy. Mm hmm. Uh huh. And the horse he rode in on. And everything absolutely. Else. Yep, absolutely. Poor horse. It's bad. Yeah, I know. For real. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, we'll get there next week, everybody. Yeah. All right. Thanks for tuning in to Brew Crime. You can find us on all social media platforms at Brew Crime. We have a Facebook group at Brew Crime Group. If you would like to support the show, head to patreon.com slash brew crime now. The money goes towards upgrading equipment and making the show that much better. You get one bonus episode a month as well as early ad free access to our episodes. So shout out to our Patreon supporters. Amber, True Crime Nana. The Faves of Our Lives podcast and Three Biz In podcast. Cheers. Bye. All cases in brew crime are written by Mike and JT or a writer we credit on the episode and sources are put into our show notes for each episode. We always want to give credit to the people that research the cases we talk about. Check out our store at tpublic.com slash stores slash brew hyphen crime hyphen podcast where you can purchase gear like t-shirts, phone cases, stickers, pillows, and all kinds of other cool stuff. Brew Crime's intro was created by Mike using Creative Commons Attribution Licensed Audio from purple-planet.com, soundbible.com, and freesoundeffects.com. Logo designed by Ben Greenberg. Thanks for listening to this episode of Brew Crime Podcast. All right. <laughs> yeah. That up. Well, he did not give... Oh, wait, sorry. Never mind that. Delete that one line. <laughs>